Now, The Winter's Tale is one of Shakespeare's four so-called romances, written right toward the end of his career as a, a playwright, probably uh, 1607, 1613. And uh, it's a strange, strange beast, as we are going uh, to see. It's almost, uh, these were written right after his great tragedies, and it's almost as if Shakespeare wanted to rewrite the tragedies, to somehow soften them. In, in the wonderful words of uh, Nori Epstein, she says, melt the, the wintry vision of the tragedies with images of rebirth and reconciliation. But folks, the first half of this play, and thanks to Anne for the artwork here, uh, the first half of this play is pure tragedy. Uh, is, uh, with very strong echoes of Othello. And so Leontes, king of Sicilia, his wife Hermione, are playing host to Polixenes, the king of Bohemia, childhood friend, dearest friend of Leontes. Now, in the play Othello, it takes two and a half acts and a whole lot of manipulation by Iago for Othello to come to believe wrongly that his wife Desdemona has been unfaithful to him. In The Winner's Tale, it takes 110 lines <laughs> for Leontes to believe that Hermione has been unfaithful with Polixenes. Okay? Uh, 110 lines. Now, I have to tell you that for a long time, I, I, kinda, I considered that a real flaw, the suddenness of that, a real flaw, almost beneath Shakespeare. I could always get a rise out of Jim by saying, oh, the winner's tale, you mean Othello without the motivation, I would say. <laughs> and he was, mm, so sort I of think, um, you know, that, w that was a pretty short-sighted view, I have come to realize. I have grown uh, in that regard. You know, you know but, but let's think about it, let's think about it. Let's think about two reasons why that's wrong. A, Shakespeare didn't have to rewrite Othello. He'd done it already, okay? Why do it again? Secondly, and I think this is, this is the best point, it's somewhat ironic, I think this play makes the point of Othello better than Othello does. That is to say that jealousy by its nature is completely irrational, completely inexplicable. Iago warns Othello, oh, beware my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. Iago says, trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmations as strong as proofs of holy writ. Emilia says, jealous souls are never jealous for the cause. They are jealous for they are jealous. That's all it takes. So let's not be surprised when 110 lines into the play, when Polixenes innocently grabs Hermione's hands and Leontes watching, he says, too hot, too hot. He doesn't like that at all. And he comes to conclude right at that point, all's true that is mistrusted. Everything that I suspect is true. Suspicion becomes truth. That's what happens in jealousy, isn't it? And we're still in the, tra the tragedy part of this play, this tragic comedy. As in the tragedy, Le Leontes' folly will cost him dearly. Like Othello, he'll lose a wife. He'll lose a son, Mamilius. Mamilius. <laughs> he did this rather quickly. Mamilius, who dies of grief on hearing his mother accused of what she is. Uh, he, like Shades of King Lear, he banishes, he is convinced, uh, we'll see Hermione's pregnant when this all happens, he's convinced that the child is Polixenes' child. And so his daughter Perdita, he has banished to Bohemia to either die or live as it happens to work out. So he pays dearly for his folly uh, in this play. Tragedy. And then, uh, presto, suddenly halfway, almost virtually halfway through the play, talk about for the formulaic writing, we have a comedy, a romantic comedy. We switch to Bohemia. We know Shakespeare loves to use conflicting places. We're in Bohemia, and boy, okay, things aren't always hung. We know even in the comedies there are snags. The course of true love never did run smooth. So we have to have all kinds of, you know, things going on. Um, and, uh, and to my, just get my notes here. Um, 16 years have passed. How do we know 16 years have passed? Because a character, time, comes out and tells us so. <laughs> uh, talk, Shakespeare is notoriously cavalier about time, if you know his plays. And no, he's just almost just, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll pay, we'll, 16 years will go. So time will tell us that. Perdita uh, has been raised by a shepherd, and uh, she has fallen in love with, uh, with Polixenes' uh, son, Florizel. And he in love with her. 
But of course, because this is a comedy, we have to have parental interference. Polixenes would never approve of Florizel marrying a mere shepherd's daughter. So he is disguised as a swain uh, named Doricles. And of course, and then of course, to check on what's going on, Polixenes will disguise himself. This is a comedy after all, this part of the play. So we'll have characters in disguise. <coughs> It'll all work out, of course, as comedies always do. A lot of fun shenanigans in Act 4. The shepherd that raises Perdita, the clown who is uh, the son, uh, uh, and then a wonderful character named uh, Autolycus, this rogue thief that's uh, uh, picking pockets and conning people right and left. And so we get a lot of, of, of fun uh, kind of comedy. And only in Bohemia could Shakespeare give us the stage direction that has been the bane of set designers and directors for almost 400 years. When Antigonus leaves the baby Perdita at the end of Act 3 and Shakespeare has to get him off stage, Shakespeare gives us this stage direction. Exit Antigonus pursued by a bear. <laughs> now, uh, the wintry, so, so we, have, we have a half tragedy, half comedy. The wintry vision of the tragedies is really uh, softened by uh, a couple of things in this play. One is the uh, two strong forces of good in the play. Often so much in the tragedies, the good characters are thwarted by the villains, by the scheming of an Iago or an Edmund. In this case, we have a couple of great uh, uh, strong characters. We have, uh, we have Camillo, who uh, Leontes orders to poison Polixenes. He wants him dead, and Camillo instead helps him to escape and then goes to live with him in Bohemia and be a, a loyal lifetime subject. He'll be disguised too when Polixenes is checking up on his son. The other is perhaps, and I, I, I just kind of rethought this, maybe the strongest female character in all of Shakespeare, Paulina, wife of the antagonist exit. I don't want, I need to tell you, the news with the bear is not good. Um, uh, an antagonist, but, uh, but Paulina, this wonderfully this wonderfully spunky character at, at one point in Act Two, at one point in Act Two, when uh, uh, I'm on the wrong page here, uh, at one point in Act Two, when uh, when uh, Leontes orders the servants, get her out of here, Paulina, she says, quote, let him who makes but trifles of his eyes first hand me. Yeah, good. If you don't care about your eyes, yeah, come on, give it a shot. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see that in Act 5, she takes over the play, and she becomes very much what Portia does in Act 4 of The Merchant of Venice, and she doesn't have to disguise herself as a man to do it. So uh, really, a wonderful uh, character that we'll see. And the other thing that really uh, absolutely dispels the wintry vision of the tragedies is the play's final scene, the one that was so important to Jim uh, in his development. And, uh, and it's in that scene that Shakespeare shows us that the wrongs of the past, uh, they're not forgotten, but they are forgiven. There is that possibility. And that, as with the most of the romances, all four of the romances, in fact, Shakespeare lets us know that uh, what is precious cannot ever uh, completely be lost. It, it can't. Precious things tend to, uh, tend to endure. So, so we'll have that to, to soften that.